The Gospel this morning for Thanksgiving from Luke chapter 17, Jesus desires and deserves our thanks. We read, Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. This is the gospel of the Lord. God's word that we consider for this Thanksgiving day is Psalm 100. It was in the opening verses of our service, but we're going to read it again. It says, a psalm for giving thanks. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. In his courts with praise, give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Round them all up. Bring them all. Get those teens off their phones and away from their video games. Bring those shoppers from their super sales and their malls. Get the cooks out of the kitchen, the grillers from the grill, or the smokers from their smoker. Get those sports-minded fans this afternoon away from their football. Bring them all. Bring them all, including those people that are stuffed with turkey, taking their afternoon siestas. Grab them and bring them. In fact, you can even bring those crazy relatives of yours. Everybody has them, those crazy aunts or uncles. Bring the crazy relatives. Even those ones that when they get together for family gatherings, they like to talk politics. You can bring them too. You see, God wants a full house for Thanksgiving. God wants everybody here at his house gathered together for Thanksgiving. And what I'm talking about when I say for Thanksgiving, it's not this once every 365 days a year that the United States has set apart a national day for Thanksgiving. Do you understand the text we have before us in Psalm 100? is 3,000 years old. Likely a psalm that King David wrote. Most likely. But this psalm... Ever since the ink dried on that final period of the Hebrew language, in a manner of speaking, it's been appropriate every single day of this earth's existence. Which means this is a psalm for thanksgiving every single day. Everybody is invited every single day, which includes you. Everybody's invited to come before the Lord to overflow and let thanksgiving overflow from their heart to the Lord. And as you come before the Lord, you've got a variety of methods for how you can do that according to the psalmist. Listen to these from verses 1 and 2. He says, Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. So you, coming from your car to the front doors of the church today, you could have come shouting for joy to the Lord at the top of your lungs. That's one method you could have chosen. All the way till your pew. The next portion says, worship the Lord with gladness. The verb there, worship, actually can also be serve. So worshiping and serving the Lord, same concept. But how do you worship and serve God with gladness? Well, it's actually probably doing what you're doing right now. You're coming before the Lord to serve him. This is a worship service. This is service going on, not just for me as I stand here. This is service on behalf of God's people. You're doing what Mary did. You're treasuring up these things in your heart as you listen to the word of God. And you're letting the gospel touch your heart and affect your soul. And and gladness is overflowing at what God is doing and has done for you and will continue to do for you. And so you're participating right now. And you're singing the hymns. And you're listening to the, to the word of God from the choirs. That, that, that's the second option. The third option 
the psalmist brings to you is, come before him with joyful songs. And so as you come to the house of the Lord, maybe you can sing a solo. Maybe you could be part of a small group. Maybe you could come to choir practices and, and then warm up and get ready for an event like this to be able to participate in singing with the choir in a festival service. Of those three options, the third one's my personal favorite. Because that Hebrew word for joyful songs actually is translated elsewhere in the Old Testament as ostrich. And you're probably sitting there wondering, what in the world do joyful songs and ostriches have in common? That's a great question. And according to some of the, to some of the books that I've, I've looked at, Hebrew books and etymology, word studies, things like that, several of the possibilities include, maybe it's the, the sound of the flapping of the ostrich wings that reminded God's people of praise when they came together. And these celebratory functions when they came to Jerusalem. Maybe it was the kind of guttural whining voice of, of that ostrich as it cried out that reminded God's people of the praises as they were lifted up and ascending to the Lord. Maybe, and, and I went to YouTube and saw this, it, it's actually kind of a neat thing. Maybe it's the visual of the ostrich. It's just kind of a smooth thing that it goes back and forth with its wings. Maybe it just reminded God's people maybe of their prayers. When they pray, they go like this often, that, that it was almost like praise ascending to the Lord. I mean, even Job 39 verse 13 says, the wings of the ostrich flap joyfully. <laughs> just think that that's their impression of this ostrich, a praiseworthy or a, a creature that seems to emulate praise to the Lord. But interestingly, I, I don't know that in the year 2019, if you tell Mr. C or if you tell our choir after the service today, you sounded like a bunch of ostriches. I, I don't know that that's going to be very complimentary today. And I think you're right. And I think we need to be careful that we don't miss the point here of what the psalmist is trying to say to us this morning. You see, with this Psalm 100, especially verses 1 and 2, this part where it says, come before him with joyful songs, and I, I said it's like the choir, the soloist, or the small group. This is not an America's Got Talent search where God is looking for those particular voices that can come before him because they sound so smooth and, and they sound so polished, and certainly they can, can lift their voices to the Lord and praise him where the rest of us, like me, who can't sing necessarily like this, that we can siphon out those truly praiseworthy people. God is going to be pleased with them. That, that, that's not what this is about. This is a talent search. This is an invitation for those that God has gifted by the Holy Spirit through the gospel. God is looking for the talent that he's given you. The talent to give thanks to the Lord. Because only God's people can do that. And for those who can't do that, if they don't know the Lord yet, they're invited too. Because guess what the gospel does? It creates faith. It creates thanksgiving. And so God invites those people to hear the gospel or to be refreshed and encouraged by the gospel so that your hearts here overflow, not just with joy, but joy to the Lord. Shout for joy to the Lord, it says. God's people can do that. Worship the Lord with gladness. Don't be afraid to come before the Lord with joyful songs, no matter what you sound like, no matter how good or not so good of a singer you are. Come before him without fear because this is about giving praise to the Lord. No matter what you look like. Uh, one of the neatest worship services that I've ever been at, and this is just my opinion, one of the neatest worship services I was ever privileged to be a part of was a Jesus Cares worship service in the city of Milwaukee. During my seminary days, I, I got to go and lead a worship service. I had no idea what to expect and started with a prayer, started with a three to four minute devotion, and I had no idea what was coming next. If you don't know what a Jesus Cares worship service is, it was 40 to 50 people, sort of in a packed room, but these 40 to 50 people had Down syndrome. They were Christians, Wisconsin Synod Lutherans. They were brought together in that room.
They either had Down syndrome or they had special needs. And after the devotion, instruments were handed out to them and they began singing. And with their instruments and with their singing and with their shouting, it was just tremendous. It was incredible. Now, mind you, and I'm going to say this gently and delicately, to the human ear and to the human eye, what I saw and what I heard sounded terrible and looked terrible. And, and I don't mean that rudely. You understand, they didn't, they didn't have any rhythm. They didn't sing in tune. They didn't start when the director said start. And even the song, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know, they didn't necessarily know all the words. And they're flailing their instruments in the air. And if anything looked like a bunch of ostriches, really they did. But that day they gave greater praise than I ever have in my life. Because they didn't hold back from God their heart. They weren't afraid of what they looked like. They weren't afraid of what they sounded like. They were there to give thanks to the Lord for their blessings, <laughs> for what he had done for them in Jesus. And they let it out tremendously. You see, that's what God is looking for. That's the invitation he sends out by the gospel. That's why we've come to, to give thanks and praise to the Lord, to fill this house no matter what we sound like. Because no matter what we sound like, God loves to hear it. See, Christians love to lift their voices to the Lord like that, not holding back, because God has lifted up his voice to us. And that's what the psalmist says in verse 3. He says, know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Now, I, I mentioned that likely King David wrote this. And when I say that, I'm speaking from, from human perspective. David was the human writer of these words, most likely. But what I'm also saying is that we recognize from the Bible that God wrote this. God the Holy Spirit wrote this word for word through David and with his abilities and gifts. This is God's word, which means this is what God wants you to hear. This is what God wants you to know. And from a, from a little slightly different perspective, when God speaks, it means he wants you to know him. He wants to be known. He wants you to hear this. You see, out of all of the options people have in life to celebrate, and out of all of the false gods and false worship that's going on even today, where people are going and giving thanks to things that are idols and not gods, or they're worshiping the wrong thing, things that can't save them, things that don't deserve their thanks and praise, or, or maybe just as bad, if not just a hint worse, people who are going nowhere, they're just staying home and they're not giving thanks anywhere. God's invited you here to match your praise and thanks with its rightful source to the person who truly deserves it. And so God matches your thanks to the one true and only God because he's the one, he's the one who deserves it. Not only because he's miraculously made you, not only because he's powerfully preserved you and brought you to this day, but because verse 3 of this psalm brings out that God has so lovingly recreated you in his image by the gospel with the result that God declares in this verse, we are his. I mean, feast on that. We are his. Because for God to say that, it cost him dearly. For God to invite the world here, for God to invite all the earth to his house, to know him, to learn of him, for God to invite you here, and to have this gospel truly be good news for you, for you to be his favored people, it, it means that God had to punish his perfect son. And to draw this out even further, you understand the voice of Jesus and the heart of Jesus? His was the life that gave perfect praise to his father. Jesus had the life that every single thing he did, it just made his father light up. God the Father delighted in Jesus in everything he said, everything he did. 
And Jesus wasn't afraid to give God the glory and the praise and the thanks every single second and moment of his life. In fact, Jesus wasn't even afraid to come here and live as a human being, to be one of us. And he wasn't even afraid to go to the cross and to be sin for us. You see, that's what we deserve. Not a cross just for a couple of hours, but we deserve to be under the thumb of God for an eternity. That's what our sin deserved. The wrath of God. And yet here we are. And yet here we are loved by God because he's revealed that to us in the Bible. And yet here we are looking at the scriptures and we can say definitively the work of Jesus Christ forgives all of our sin in totality. And to take it even a step further, the Holy Spirit is revealed to all of us and declares firmly, we are his. We belong to him. So incredible is what God has done for people who don't deserve it. So incredible is this, what God has done, that he goes back in verse 4 to say the same thing basically in verses 1 and 2 and say, come on out all the earth, come before the Lord. And so he says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. And finally he says, For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. One last thing about the ostrich. Obviously the ostrich has wings. We've been talking about it today. But the ostrich is an incredibly heavy animal. It can't fly. And so the question is, why on earth would an ostrich have wings if it can't fly? Why would God give it wings? In the San Diego Zoo website, it says those wings that the ostrich has, they're, they're not decorative, they're not ornamental. They serve a purpose. The reason God gives an ostrich wings is so that it keeps its balance in life as it runs, as it does what it needs to do. And so here in this final verse of our psalm, God says he is good, meaning he is an absolute. There is nothing better than God. It's never going to get anything higher than who he is. He is the top. And he's going to always stay good. And his love is faithful to us. It's going to endure forever through generation after generation. God's flavored promises to, the, to his people are never going to change. They're going to stay faithful and so as God continues to pour these things out on us day after day and be faithful to us through his word, you know, we keep coming back to this because as sinful people, day in and day out, we can't earn heaven. We can't soar and fly up to heaven. We can't get there without him. And so we keep coming back every day to his grace. But it's not right for us to keep taking from him and then going and living our own way. To keep coming back and taking like those nine lepers and then walking away and doing our own thing, that's ingratitude. That's thanklessness. And so God figuratively has given us wings. Even though we can't fly to heaven on our own. What do I mean by that? He's given you something to stay in balance. He's given you your voice so that you can shout for joy to the Lord. He's given you your voice so that you can worship the Lord with thanksgiving and gladness. He's given you a voice to let these joyful songs come from your heart and sing to the Lord and let him know you're grateful for what he's done to fill the air with thanksgiving every day of your life. That you take these truths that you've heard here that you take them and share them with your neighbor. That you take these things and you share them with your children and hand them down from generation to generation so that the whole earth is invited by the gospel to give thanks to the Lord every day and to come before the Lord with thanksgiving so that the house of the Lord swells. You see, God would love nothing more. In fact, that's really what God wants after all, isn't it? God wants a full house of people shaped by the gospel, of people so thankful for what he's done. God wants a full house for thanksgiving. Amen. Please stand.